All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golan from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm joined by Brandon Voss, who is the Director of Training and Operations at Black Swan Group. How are you doing, Brandon? I'm doing very well. I'm, I'm happy to be, uh, be here with you today. Great. And where are you today, Brandon? So I'm just outside the D.C. area in, yeah, okay. in, uh, in College Park. I'm actually in my home office. I got, I got my dogs here in the office sleeping here next to me. Excellent, excellent. That's a good way to that's a good way to start your day. Um, okay, so uh, Brandon, tell me a little bit about um, how you got into uh, negotiations, and especially I want you to talk about how you have taken a unique approach of of adopt, uh, adapting the FBI hostage negotiation techniques to the corporate space. All right, yeah, very good. So uh, obviously, you know, through my father, Chris Voss, mm-hmm. and uh, author, it never split the difference. Uh, being exposed to how he communicated with people and, and learned to communicate with people at a young age. And uh, I, I have a sales background myself before I was working with Black Swan. I did, I did retail sales for Macy's and business to business sales with Verizon. And so getting to apply it in that environment and then being able to grow within the Black Swan group. And, uh, you know, in, in this space, can't ask for a better mentor. For sure. And obviously, for those of you who may not know, you know, um, Brandon's dad, you know, Chris is a, a hostage negotiator, uh, um, long time working with the, the FBI. And um, and so you decided to take uh, that hostage negotiation a- and adapt it. So uh, tell me about how you would adapt something like that, because obviously, Obviously, there's a little bit. The stakes are a little bit higher in hostage negotiation than in an average sales negotiation. Right. I mean, you you would think, right? We think mm. about how how the stakes are higher because there's lives on the line, mm. and uh, something that that Chris always likes to mention, and, and the guys I've been introduced to through him, uh, they talk about how they know for a fact that business people have dealt with more irate. Uh, individuals yelling and and storming out and 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 causing a scene than they ever had to deal with in hostage negotiation, mm. yeah. and and I think really it starts with just the approach, right? So tell me about that. So how do you how do you go into a negotiate? Because number one, there's different types of negotiations, and obviously more than that, there's different uh, people have different approaches to negotiation. So when you go into a negotiation, how do you how do you start so you can set it up as effectively as possible? Well, the biggest thing is, you know, if there's any negatives that might be present, you want to get those out of the way early. And uh, and and human nature we, we want to deny negatives. You know, we want to say things like, I don't want you to think where our price is too high. And, mm-hmm. you know, I don't want you to think that we're jerks. And I don't want you to feel like we let you down. And those, those are actually denials of negatives. And that's that's what inflames the situation. And our approach is really to address those first. And then once you've gotten past that point, you build trust and rapport. You get to the place where we call trust-based influence. You get there quickly by sounding the other side out. You know, Stephen Covey put it great in, in seek first to understand. And that right. gets you a really long way really fast. Right. And so uh, so when you're when you go into a negotiation, how do you, I mean, often, you know, your negotiation sometimes with more than one person. So how do you uncover what, what roles they're, uh, they're playing and also what their style is? Because obviously you have to adapt it to the different people, right? Right, exactly. We talk about the different negotiator types, the, the assertive, the accommodator, and the analyst. And plainly put, it's, it's a fight, flight, or, or make friends. Mm-hmm. And when people are, are backed into a corner and they got real skin in the game, their default response is going to be one of those three things. And, and that said, you got to handle each one a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. And, and in, a, in a team negotiation, you, you're obviously, there's a high chance you're going to have multiples of, of each type at the table, you know, two or three assertives and yeah, you're an accommodator. It could be it could be a mix. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's a big part of it. And and one of the first ways to really start identifying it is just simply how they approach the negotiation. Or, or do they do they sit down and they're somewhat standoffish and they they look like they're waiting to hear what you have to say? Do they come in and they got they want to lay down the groundwork? You know, mm-hmm. they got objectives they want you to know. They come right at that. Or do they seem much more like I, I don't want to say beating around the bush, but the type that's you know, I really want to focus on how, how the last three months been for you, right? right. I mean, you know, we, we've, been, we've become aware of you, you know, why, how do things work? And, you know, so there, there are different types of conversations. 
and and you got to adapt accordingly. Your, your circumstance drives your strategy. Right. Uh, so uh, let's take the assertive, right? Because that's the one that probably throws people the most, right? You know, the uh, the, the other two were probably a little bit more at ease with, even though we obviously need to have strategies for dealing with them. So how do you deal with the assertive? Maybe the per- you go into negotiations and immediately they're, you know, they're up and they're in your face and they're ready to get going. Yeah, I think that's a great question because, again, it's human nature. Whenever we imagine going to the table, we imagine that that assertive, you know, shark-like attacking mm-hmm. person that's going to corner us, right? And how do we defend ourselves, mm-hmm. right? How do, how do we grapple with that that type of individual? And really, those 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 types of people have an, um, have a real deep internal desire to make sure that you hear them. Mm. I mean, really where they're coming from subconsciously is I want to make sure that this person hears me and I'm going to do whatever it takes to make it happen. And it's going to start by by me being very direct and, and coming at them like a freight train. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting point. So so obviously then the key is to um, allow them to be heard and kind of draw out what it is that's, that's, that they really want to say, right? Well, that's exactly it. And you put it a great way because, uh, you know, our negotiation approach starts with allowing the other side to be heard. Mm -hmm. And for all intents and purposes, this type of negotiator plays right into that very well because that's all they want to do. And so some of it is you got to put your own justifications aside. Right. It's you you know, you want to get to the table and Mm -hmm. say your own piece. You got to let that go, especially when you're dealing with this with this type. The other thing is, as soon as they feel they're they're understood, their trust for you automatically goes through the roof. Right. I mean, it's you instantly become. I can do business with this person because I can tell they get what I see. Mm-hmm. So the interesting thing about that is, obviously, if you break through that, the negotiations can often then move forward at a, at a pretty good pace, right? Now, when you have the analyzer on the other side of the table, right? Okay, so. Not so confrontational, you know, much lower key. But then the frustration, it can be on your side, right? Because you're going, oh, my goodness, is this person ever going to move? Are they going to analyze this to death? That's, yeah, that's that's it, right? And, and analysts will self-admit that, you know, they, they have a paralysis by too much analyzation, mm-hmm. right? They just, they, the analysis paralysis. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and one, one of the big things to understand with this type of person is, is number one, they're very skeptical in nature. Right. You know, they're, they're very, very slow to trust and um, uh, they need silence. They need time. You know, the, 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 the thing that they hate the most is to make a snap decision. Mm-hmm. And they look at time as, you know, the best use of time is is as long as it takes to get it right. Right. You know, we had we were doing a Chris and I were doing a job. My dad and I were doing a training recently with a, with a great group. And, and uh, Something that that someone in that group mentioned to us is, I need to make sure that I can live with this decision three to five years from now. Mm. You know, that's that's a huge yeah. part of their thought process going in. Like it's, and 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 the the emphasis that they put on that is more just based on the way that they approach the process in general. So the so the challenge for you then on the other side of the table, obviously, is to give them the space to do their analysis. But obviously, at the same time, you also want to move them forward, right? And let's face it, when you're in sales and negotiations, uh, silence and giving people time and space, it doesn't always come naturally to you, right? We have an aversion to the silence part, right? I mean, we can have talk about something and then maybe you're an analyzer. You need a few moments to process this, but we hate silence, right? That's that's it. It's a human nature response. We want to feel silence. If, if there's silence, we feel like maybe we did something wrong. We might have said the wrong thing. And with this particular type, they naturally need time to process. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's when we talk about different types dealing with each other, right? The accommodator only uses silence to show anger. Right. An accommodator is so focused on a the relationship, they're only going to go silent on you when they're when they're mad at you. Or they feel like, all right, I've, you pushed me too far. I can't do this anymore. And so in dealing with an analyst, they're going to go silent anyway. And for an accommodator, it's what did I do wrong? How did, how did, why did I, you know, why did I make them withdraw? Where did I screw this up? And then that, that can be really hard on their mind in the moment. And so number one, going in, knowing that the analyst is going to need their time to process. You, you can't push them. That'll just cause them to dig their heels, dig their heels in more. 
And then, of course, their, their emphasis on, on data. And so anal analysts don't want to negotiate, but they love to have dispassionate conversations about facts. Right. And so you can get to that very easily by using the, the skill that we refer to as labels. Because another thing about them, them being very skeptical naturally, they're skeptical of questions. They mm. don't like to answer questions fully and completely because they're afraid they may give too much up. So tell me about the labels piece then. Yeah, so the, the label, simply put, it, it's a quick way to execute a, a bit of tactical empathy, as it were. And, and it's, a, it's simply a verbal observation or a, a statement that starts with, it seems like, it sounds like, or it looks like, or it feels like. Mm. A tremendous amount of people we work with have, have gotten a long way with using things like it feels like. And so uh, foundationally in the, in the hostage negotiation world, this skill was used to hit on emotion specifically. Right. And we all know we can't avoid emotions in negotiation, right? There's no way around it. So a simple label is something like it seems like you're angry. Mm -hmm. It seems like you're very hesitant. You know, right. those, those can get you very far very quickly. Right, because what I like about that is you're not, you're not making a definitive statement. You're just saying, well, this is what it feels like. I'm, maybe I'm wrong or, or tell me how you actually feel. So you're giving it, o you're giving it over to the other person to, to express how they feel. So tell me about the accommodator, right? Because like, like most people would say, oh, if I've got an accommodator in a negotiation, I'm, I'm set. So why is that not, why is that not true? So there's, there's a lot of reasons, and interestingly enough, in, in my personal opinion, mm -hmm. and, and when I like to talk about this with clients and, and, and when we're coaching, of the three types, I think the accommodator actually has the least amount to learn mm. as far as an application of tactical empathy or, or emotional intelligence, because they're naturally built that way. They're naturally built to really actually care about you know, what, what you think and, and how you feel about stuff. And the, but the flip side of that is they're seen in, in society as pushovers. Right. Because an accommodator can get carried away with caring about you so much that they compromise their own position mm -hmm. to take care of you. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they, they can get this reputation of being pushed around. And really the, the, dangerous, the dangerous negotiator is, is a natural accommodator that has really learned how to analyze and assert when they need to. Right. And so those, those can be, very, especially when they come from, the accommodator side naturally they haven't had to learn it mm -hmm. but um but yeah they're i mean very powerful i mean i, I would always want an accommodator at the table with me you know sure. if i'm going into a team negotiation i'm going to want to have an accommodator as a second mover every time without question yeah so it seems at the end of the day that um if to effective negotiations you either need to learn and be able to adapt these different types uh, at the right time or if that is something maybe you're just an assertive person who can't do it then you bring in somebody who can compliment you that's that's a great point i mean that's a great point i mean they, they say there's lots of studies out there that in order to have a good team you got to have people that think differently right mm -hmm. you can't have a team made up of people that think the same you're not going to accomplish as much and so yeah that's a great point that's a great point and, and as far as Executing, yes, you have to incorporate all three styles into what you do. There's, there's some directions you're going to want to lean a little bit heavier than others, right? You're going to want to sure. be in the accommodator set or at least tone of voice more often than not. But really the focus is how do we see it in other people, right? Going back to understanding and looking at it from their point of view, if we're caught up in how we're executing, sometimes that, that actually, right, the, the muscle memory doesn't mm -hmm. kick in. So we got to build that muscle memory and we see the assertive, okay, I know I got to go in with mirrors. Right. I got to sound them out for 10 or 15 minutes because mm -hmm. they're going to have things they need to say, right? It's, it's an accommodator. They may promise me too much. You know, mm -hmm. I got to focus on calibrated questions that really dig into implementation, right? Mm -hmm. How is that going to work? How are you going to make sure that happens? How do we incorporate all these uh, different mindsets into this decision-making process? And so, you know, the, the, you got to adapt, right? A, a circumstance going to drive your strategy. Yeah, and so do you think that enough people put put enough thought into what they want out of a negotiation? Because often people just go in to negotiation, they think it's about one thing only, and that's about getting the best price on one side of the table or getting the lowest, you know, lowering the price or hiring the price, whatever. But the people tend to micro-focus on that one outcome. That's a, yeah, that's a great term, micro-focus. Yeah, we, we, get, we get tunnel vision when we think that it's only about one thing. 
And the the black swan group, I mean, the 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 the, the name comes from the idea of finding the black swan, mm-hmm. finding that that piece of information that if if uncovered would completely change your outcome. And we say that there's at least three to five of those in every interaction. So you go in with the idea of sounding them out, but really it's it's kind of a selfish purpose of I'm here to be smarter. Mm-hmm. There's things, there's information that you have that there's no way I can get it unless you tell me. So how do I put you in a place where you trust me enough right. to be able to expose some of that stuff? And then once we iron that, iron that out, it's going to completely change our destination. So right. if I'm caught up in the destination ahead of time, I may miss an opportunity to to bend up in an even better place. Yeah, and let's face it, like people can people can tell when you're just trying to push them over the finish line and when they're not ready to go and it, and like anybody if if somebody pushes you what do you do you start to dig your heels in yeah yeah again hum, it's a human nature response like uh, you you will be obstinate just to prove a point yeah right i i'll i'll hurt me because i know it hurts you at the same time <laughs> and that's good enough <laughs> so which is the opposite of a win win and at the end of the <laughs> at the end of the day at your negotiation you should really be looking for a win win here right well, I think it, you know, it's it's it even goes beyond that mm-hmm. because, you know, win-win can easily be interpreted as both sides felt like they lost, so it was mm-hmm. probably a good deal. And actually there are people out there you'll find that'll say things like that. And and really more so it's, you know, I I think we like to look, we like to look at it as how do how do we both prosper out of this? Mm-hmm. Right. How do we make how do we go beyond like we we made such a great deal that you want to recommend us to people in your network because our deal was so seamless because things went so well, right? How do, how do we turn this one deal into all of a sudden now we got a community of individuals and those communities are out there, you know, in pockets. We're all doing business together and we're slowly starting to take over the world, right? How do you get to that point? Which then, um, obviously, if you go through a process like that and have that kind of outcome, then your chances of getting referrals and all of that go up, right? Because people have a good, have a good feeling, that's exactly it. what they, they refer to that, right? It's like the platinum level of, of business development. And that's mm-hmm. referrals word of mouth. And, and the more you create that, it's a snowball effect. Perfect. Listen, Brandon, this has been fascinating. Uh, we're bumping up against the end of our time. But before we go, can you tell everyone a little bit more about you, about the Black Swan Group and how they can learn more? Sure. Very good. So our, our website is, is www.blackswanltd.com. Uh, you can find out more about you know some of the yearly events that we're doing this year. We got a full list coming out at the end of this month. Um, but one one big way we keep in touch with people is through our weekly newsletter, and that mm-hmm. comes out on uh, Tuesday mornings at about nine a.m. your local time. You can sign up on the website, or you can text FBI Empathy. That's all caps. FBI Empathy, one word, to two eight two two eight, and it'll prompt you through your phone to to sign up uh, quick and easy. That's, that's a great way to keep in touch with what we're doing and, and things we're exposing the community to. Fantastic. Listen, Brandon, this has been great. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon.